Yeah, How absolutely. Oh. You're here. Thank you, Mark. You're a champ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just talking about how, you know, like US has got a uh, financial data exchange, an industry-based body that's building um, APIs in partnership with banks and fintech. Switzerland is in a place where you're not beholden to the um, PSD2 um, API regulations, but you need to interact with European banks. How, that, how is Switzerland solving that? Well, that is correct. Um, one, I'm American living here in Switzerland, so I can see both sides in terms of a market-driven approach. Um, but looking across the border in terms of the regulatory aspect of PSD2, um, and seeing what the Berlin Group has published, Open Banking UK, et cetera. Um, we get to take advantages of what's already been done. We get to view uh, the specifications of the APIs, the standardization in terms of what's already been published, um, and taking advantage of that. So not only am I a part of Credit Suisse, but also I'm part of SFTI, Swiss FinTech Innovation Group. They're an external group and working body where we actually review and apply uh, specifications and standards for APIs in the Swiss market, um, since it is a market-driven approach. So we can't, we've, do, we've done accounts, we've done payments, mortgages, personal loans. Uh, we actually have uh, Synpulse, which is a, a, one of the, let's say, firms in the Swiss market. They've actually developed an open wealth API, which is new. Um, and we also work with uh, Six, which is our Swiss exchange. They have a product called B-Link, where third-party providers can hook up to them and do consent management and the flow of data back and forth without it being um, connecting to every bank. They can actually use that as an opportunity to then connect with the banks, just having one API, one interaction and, and such. Um, when I look at you know, the regulatory aspect of what's been delivered under PSD2, we look, we, we've actually found that we can actually take advantage of what Australia is doing even though it is as well a regulated market, but in terms of securitization and interaction from the APIs via FAPI, uh, we can take that approach in the Swiss market rather than being so restrictive in terms of what PSD2 has delivered to date. Um, when, so when, you look, when you look at the banks across Europe, I mean, they, I mean, we heard from um, uh, Commerce Bank a bit earlier today, and they're really thinking outside the box with open ecosystems, but that's not because of the open banking regulation. When you actually look at um, PSD2 across Europe, it's payments and accounts, and uh, there isn't a lot of innovation beyond those. We're not seeing the open wealth APIs. We're not seeing um, the consent management from six that you were talking about. So, yeah. so is an industry-led... Um, model going to drive that innovation because they're more use cases where the partners have already agreed there's potential? Well, I think it's also driven by, by the client demand. I mean, if you look at Switzerland and wealth management, that's a big part of what Switzerland is about, especially being an island within Europe. Um, and the fact that uh, larger clients want to have, the, have a preference of seeing one view of their portfolios of having the ability to have their brokers connect to the banks or through the banks um, to then share that data. And then as well, have one login in one convenient place to review with their relationship manager, their overall portfolio and make proper decisions or mitigate risk. So, so is that, I think, is, oh yeah, so you go. No, so I think it's, it's also from a clientele point of view, um, not just a market approach, but what the clients really want and, and how they're looking for their banks to provide that. And so the banks in Switzerland have had a culture where they've been more naturally used to working with the clients, other finance providers. So they've yes. got, a, so it's more like in the US, when you look at the, um, who's involved in open banking, it quite, quite often it is the commercial banks because they're used to working in partnerships, whereas, whereas the retail banks want to own the customer. So they, they find it too much of a mind shift, shift change to make. Exactly. And, and with my role in open banking for Swiss Universal Bank, that is more of a retail clientele in terms of the, the broadness, in terms of scope of number of clients. But when then you go to the high net worth and ultra high net worth levels and their portfolios and how they want to be treated, um, that's where you have the togetherness in terms of the personal relationship of an RM, relationship manager, um, versus what the, the clients are also looking from a technology point of view and how do you marry the two together in order for both to have the same view and then have that dialogue based on what uh, what's being provided for data 
from the brokers or other banks that they're using um, to then help them manage their money. How are you seeing, so the banks that are involved um, in, do you have, so you've got um, SFTI, which is a, yeah. a network a bit like Financial Data Exchange or Open Bank in Nigeria, where it's banks and fintech working together? Yes, and also we're working with uh, insurance firms, so for bank assurance, we're also working with um, uh, mortgage lending brokers, so that way we can actually tie into what the local market is doing and as a bank, be able to then have partnerships with these uh, insurance companies or, or brokers to then have our offerings then extended beyond what we're currently doing with our own clients. So then do you have the, how, um, so the banks that are involved, how much of the Swiss um, banking market is involved then, do you think? Well, because we're tied closely with um, SIX as a Swiss exchange through VLink, ensuring that the standardizations work not only from a point to point from bank to bank or bank to broker, but also to third parties or fintech firms or accounting firms that want to have different offerings for their clients. Um, we see that more, let's say, the bigger banks who are not tied from a, a, a state level or cantonal level, as called here, um, have the ability to be at the forefront of that, whereas the state banks or cantonal banks are um, fast followers, let's say. Okay, right, but there is but there is um, an appetite for APIs there. Is, there. there is. Yeah. yeah, and and for the innovation that's going to come from that, because when you look at Europe, then you know Europe does have the PSD two um, regulations, but banks have been you know ca can be you know, like like I said, you've got Commerce Bank and others that are um, leadership um, banks and understand the opportunity of partnerships, but for the bulk, there is actually. Um, they put in blocks. So until uh, June this year, banks weren't putting in the um, PSD2 apps in a way that made uh, uh, made third-party apps be able to build their customer base. And that took the European Banking Authority to write a special paper on the obstacles that banks have been presented for there to be final change. So now FinTech has seen instead of 20% uptake of app users who are connecting their bank accounts, it's 60%. But yeah. like it took for that, how, you know, the, is there any opportunity? How do you share the value that's created for all players that you show that fintech can become viable, but there's also new bank business models opportunities here? Well, I, <clears throat> since it is a market driven approach, I think it's based on partnership. So because of the fact that you have, um, we don't have a centralized area that is actually controlling uh, third-party providers being certified. So that actually means that if you're having a relationship it, that is banked to third party, you have to do the due diligence on that. You have to ensure that they're securing the client information and not abusing that. Um, that's where SIX and B-Link is trying to play that role or potentially play that role in the future. But until then, it's kind of that level of trust between the third party and the banks and, and where you want to take it from there. And again, it's on client demand. So if there is um, a fintech firm that has a great product and there are a lot of clients who are using that product or want to use that product, that will then drive forward the openness between the banks and that one fintech or different fintechs that, that have that clientele. Is there, so is there any way to then show to the banks um, the the benefit to how is that expressed as far as the benefit well to each of those players so say you um like who's driving that sort of demonstrating the value that's been um that, that's been generated well again that comes down to the clients so there is a, a wealth manager aggregator here in switzerland called altu and we have a number of clients as other banks do that the clients use altu to aggregate their portfolios. And from that, even before Open Wealth API, we were already interacting with this firm um, to provide data because that was the client demand. And when you have clients who are of value, you want to ensure that you're taking care of them in the right way. So again, right. it's from a market-driven approach and a clientele approach, you know, that is what's driving the Swiss market. And the banks coming together to have discussions in terms of where we want to take it next um, is a part of that collaboration. How do you how do you reconcile? Uh, so then, I mean, a lot of clients will have U.S. Um, bank accounts as well. They'll have um, European bank accounts. How do you incorporate 
the PSD2 or the F, uh, you know, financial data exchange APIs are long into, you know, do you, are you looking at an API aggregator to make it to be the middleware that um, brings all of those APIs or how, do, how are the banks handling that as well as the home brewed APIs? Well, there are not a lot, a large number of banks in Switzerland. I mean, if you look at private banks or if you look at brokers or wealth managers, yes, there's a, a large number. But when you look at banks in terms of offering the full suite of products, um, you have the cantonal level or state banks that do that. You have the likes of UBS, Credit Suisse, RIFIs, and, and a few others. But it's not a, a, a large number overall in terms of that. And when I look at SFTI and what we're doing with the different banks, um, we're, we're including cantonal banks in those discussions too. But it's a matter of how we then bring that together into the market with white papers and discussion points and agreeing with the Swiss Banking Association in terms of what we're doing. Um, that then it moves forward because then all of a sudden there's more banks that want to participate. And with that collaboration, that's how you reconcile what it is that we drive from a market point of view. Right. Going back to your point about the clients should, um, showing the value, you know, receiving the value and they're the one driving the way forward as well. The issue with um, the wider open banking regulation is like a lot of the goals are, you know, more consumer choice more and it's sort of hinted at it sort of assumed then if you've got more consumer choice you've got greater financial health you know or well-being but there's no actual measures to be able to show that um one that you the one that there is that greater choice um so the wealth management apps that um you're being able to discuss but two even if you had those wealth management apps you c couldn't show that like in the last year you've saved x amount of dollars additionally because you've been using these products that are driven by open banking APIs. Whereas it sounds like your clientele or the clients of your of the people of the banks and the fintech in your networks, they've got that. They know how much this uh, the altitude is making a difference. Yes. And so, that's where and that's where for com from a competitive nature, um, the banks have to be the fast followers now. Right. And from that, you know, with Al2 and what they've been able to create based on client demand, um, we as banks now need to look at it in the same manner and be a bit more uh, savvy from a technology point of view um, and, and agree in principle that we're not going to steal clients along the way. <laughs> but I think that also comes down to the user experience and the client experience and what you deliver through your mobile app or through your on online journey for the client that they would then find a preference in terms of their main bank versus a secondary bank in terms of what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, yeah. The um, the we do have a question um from one of our audience members in the centrally regulated Europe. The banks must allow everyone authorized access to user data, and this is like the Australian situation you were describing as well. How yes. do banks in Swiss uh, Switzerland decide who they let in and who they don't want to deal with? So this viewer has heard that the fintech with clients are welcome, but if you're starting, if you're a new startup that's trying to demonstrate a fintech with potential, but you don't have any clients at the moment, how, you know, how would you, how would that startup go about entering into the market? Well, from that, we have a few Kickstarter programs here in Switzerland. I'm actually involved in that in terms of the fintech community. And that's where you then build up relationships, trust and partnerships. Um, and then from there, you get to move forward. And especially if through the Kickstarter program, there is um, the, the buy-in from the different banks and insurance companies that participate this as judges, um, then obviously that FinTech firm will probably have more of a benefit than those that don't. Now, from a startup point of view, and I've worked for a few startups, so I know how difficult it is, especially when you're trying to raise capital, um, it is having that unique selling proposition in terms of why a bank would want to deal with you, even when you're in your startup stage, and you might not have the benefit of a Kickstarter program um, to do that. And that's where wow. even with Credit Suisse, we have a fintech fund where we invest in different fintech firms and we try to promote that relationship and also do work with them. Right. The uh, can, can they join SFTI? Um, I'm How, not in charge of SFTI, but... but no, no, but is, it, is, uh, sure. <laughs> but is it more... But is SFTI more for established players or is there a startup ecosystem 
for fintech that you're aware of? Well, we're talking about having a um, consolidated sandbox view. Um, so that way we don't, as banks, have to build individual sandbox, but we have one for Switzerland as a whole. And that's where anybody would be able to then come in, plug and play, and then use that in terms of the interactive nature, test, and then go live into production eventually with um, the data that they would require. So then, okay, great. I want to invite Mehdi um, up on to, to join me up on the stage. Um, uh, and if he's not able to, I'll ask his question, but I'll leave it for him for a second. The With that then, where does SFTI stand or Credit Suisse stand on to, in terms of the... Um, the stand, like, is it about having a common API standard that is industry or that's market driven that everyone agrees to, or is each bank building their own APIs and then fintech have to connect with each one individually? Well, it's twofold. One, with an SFTI, we're setting the standards and specifications for the APIs. So therefore, each bank has a common API approach um, with the same data quality and the same data models. And then from there, it's a matter of if a third party provider would want to go through B-Link and with B-Link, they actually connect to all the banks that are available through B-Link. And then it's one API for them to get all the data because the banks are feeding their APIs into the B-Link program. And then it's one API facing off for each third party provider with all that data. Right. I mean, if you look at the difference in the UK and Europe, UK has gone much faster as far as the fintech being able to build because they're building to the one API that all of the um, yes. UK banks are using. We're it's, taking the new approach. Yeah. We're, okay, great. Yeah, no, great to hear. I mean, Australia's got that as well with their model and, and so on. So, yeah. I mean, it's if you want to get the fintech with the most opportunity on board, you're going to need to... Um, uh, you're going to need to be able to have an API that's for, simple for them to use. Exactly. How's the um, how we, how's the developer experience for? Um, do, the, do the banks in Switzerland get it as far as making that easy, or is it first of all because it's it's is it how self serve is it? Well, that's where the market is still a bit immature in terms of having a marketplace where you know APIs are readily available with the specifications. Um, some are better than others. I mean, for us with Ben Credit Suisse, um, we've actually gone live with two APIs, more from a bank to bank perspective, but we do have a catalog and backlog of items that we're delivering next year and in 2022. So from that, we, we're doing it based on client demand. We're based on where the market is going. And we're also looking across our whole global um, aspect in terms of other divisions and what our other divisions are doing so that we can do likewise locally here in Switzerland. Okay, sure. The there is the uh, with like there you've you're are you can, you're obviously an evangelizer for a market driven approach. What do you see though as the limitations of a market driven approach? Is there any areas where you wish that there was that um, this the carrot or the stick of government regulation? Well, yes, especially when it comes to a centralized platform to certify third party providers because. If, if um, fintech firms or such are not going to go through B-Link, then it is individual connectivity, right? So then we have our own due diligence to do, our own um, IT security program to go through, and that's a bit more cumbersome in terms of timeline of delivery and be able to then um, have the right thing for our clients or the clients through the fintech firms. On the other side of that, um, at the moment, because it is market-driven, any bank can say no. So at some point... At some point, um, you want it to be competitive, but you also want it to be collaborative. And I think even if without having it based on a regulation that you, what you must do, it's about the likes of SFTI and other API working groups coming together with the banks and insurers, et cetera, on these standards, and then paving the roadmap in terms of which APIs are important for us in Switzerland as a community, and then how we drive that forward. Right. Welcome, Mehdi, to the stage. Yeah. Hey, hello, Mark. Hello, Brent. I hope you're doing well. Yeah, uh, yeah. so I had a, a last question before having our next speaker is, is about, you know, the, the Swiss banking market, let's say it seems to have been really uh, about discretion over the last 30 years. And now how do they feel about being open, right? <laughs> well, let's say with, um, 
regulatory change around the world, Switzerland has been open for the most part, especially with uh, complying to US regulation. Um, so, I mean, that has been a matter of time anyway. So in terms of being open from a competitive nature within Switzerland, that's a different story in terms of how the view is from a global perspective. So that's where that's why I look across the border. That's why I look to Australia um, and even another market driven approach like uh, something like New Zealand, as an example, in terms of where are these other areas going and what can we learn from that and then how we can take it to the next level from a Swiss point of view. Yeah, New Zealand's an awesome model. Okay, I'll, I'll jump off, um, uh, but really great to have a chat, Brent. And thanks everyone uh, for attending the sessions this afternoon. Thanks for all of our awesome speakers.